So uh, at our university in Singapore, we're quite fortunate to have uh, essentially a fully functioning uh, water treatment plant on our campus that's available for cybersecurity research. Um, so it's, it, it's the full process. You get drinking water at the end of it, although I've, I've never tried. Um, and uh, across its five tanks, it's doing things like dechlorination, ultrafiltration, reverse osmosis, et cetera, et cetera. And it's fully automated. So each of the five uh, stages in this tank are controlled by a programmable logic controller, a PLC, uh, which is sensing the environment and actuating, so driving the system forward. So the question that we, uh, that we started to ask was how could we be sure that these PLCs have not been modified? How can we be sure that somebody unscrupulous hasn't come along and, uh, and, and changed the program to drive it into a state where it's overflowing or underflowing or setting on fire or what have you? So um, we started looking at the literature uh, and uh, looking at some classical approaches which had been presented at this conference before. Uh, but unfortunately, we found that we hit a, a bit of a dead wall here because the, the PLCs we were equipped with were proprietary closed and we had a very limited support from the vendors. So we looked for a bit of a third way uh, and, and came across the concept of, of physical attestation, where instead of modifying the PLCs directly, uh, what we do is build some model uh, of the overall system. And then as new data is being produced, as the system's running, we take that uh, data, uh, we judge it against the model, and determine whether it's uh, looking abnormal or looking normal, and uh, whether an alert should be sent uh, to an engineer. So this is the approach we started uh, looking into. Um, but uh, of course, the big question is, how do you build uh, such a model for a system like this? So uh, of course, what is a cyber physical system? The, the control and the physical processes are tightly intertwined. Uh, and it doesn't make much sense to look at one part without the other. Um, and while these PLCs, they're actually you know, relatively easy to model, uh, you can think of them in this system as being uh, like big nested if statements uh, without any looping. So very, very simple structurally. Uh, the physical environment is, uh, is a bit more challenging. So you need to uh, be able to uh, you know, model processes such as uh, uh, the dynamics of water flow, how pH values evolve over time. And it's certainly uh, beyond my expertise as a computer scientist. So uh, what we set out to do instead was to uh, try and apply some learning to try and uh, help us to build this model uh, automatically. Um, so we, we took a step back and looked at the two situations uh, that we want essentially this model to identify. Uh, we want it to be able to recognize when the system is, is operating normally, as on the left, and we want it to be able to uh, uh, raise an alarm when the system's behaving abnormally in some sense as on the right. So essentially what we were aiming for was to uh, build uh, some kind of uh, model, some kind of classifier that sits at this boundary and is able to uh, give you one or the other uh, with, a, with a decent amount of, of reliability. So how did we do this? Uh, well, we used a, we proposed a five uh, step process, which I'm gonna uh, go over quite quickly today. Uh, our first two steps are essentially concerning the, the collection of raw data. And then the final steps are about uh, extracting uh, it in a usable form, uh, doing some simple learning, and evaluating the classifier we get out at the end, whether it actually has some utility, whether it has some use uh, in detecting some different kinds of attacks, as we mentioned at the beginning. So uh, the first thing we do, uh, this green box is, is randomly uh, simulate the system to try and get some raw data about its normal behavior. So I, I must mention that here we're using a, a faithful a partial simulator that concerns uh, the water processes here. Uh, when we set out this work, we wanted to be able to play with the parameters a bit without the safety concerns and the, the, the wastes of resources. And uh, by focusing on the, the, the water uh, flow processes, uh, we fixed our state um, in our data log uh, to be the levels of the five tanks in the system. So we log it every five milliseconds and get a big data log of how uh, these values evolve over time. With respect to many different initial configurations, the extreme ones and randomly se selected ones in, in the middle. Uh, following this, of course, we, we, we want to get some examples of raw data of the system behaving abnormally. Uh, so we didn't want to do this in, a, in an ad hoc way. We wanted to be somewhat systematic. So we turned uh, to some inspiration from uh, software engineering, from the software testing world, and that is mutation testing. So we're not actually doing any testing here, but rather we're using the concept of generating uh, code mutations uh, 
uh, as a way of, 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 of systematically finding uh, some, seeding some faults with this, with, this, with this system to help us with the learning. Um, so just to give you some insight as to how we do this, we, we take the original simulated PLC codes, we, we make several copies, um, and we apply a single mutation operator to each of them. So it's quite simple, it's straightforward and first order here. Um, an example of a kind of mutations on the slide, here we're changing a relation operator, um, but we do other things as well, such as uh, mutating the logic, or changing a constant, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we then have this, uh, this task of ascertaining that uh, the mutant we get is effective in the sense that it actually gives you some abnormal data that's distinct from the normal data. So I'll mention this more in a slide or two. Uh, and finally, we built a little tool uh, that could do this for our SWOT simulator uh, you know, fully automatically, generating your mutants and generating your data traces, your normal and your abnormal. Um, so just an example of a, of a, of a, of a mutation. Uh, this is extracted from one of the C PLC programs, so it's just a, it's just a nested uh, conditional. Um, I won't go into the meaning of it, but if you look at the bottom, you can see that there's an assignment to some state. Uh, we, we assign the number 19. So a very simple mutation that we do is uh, change that number uh, from 19 to 14. And it's a very small change, but it has the effect of triggering a completely different set of signals to the actuators, to the motorized valves, to the pump. And so it starts affecting the uh, the levels of the tanks quite immediately. Okay, so we collect our, our data, our normal data, our abnormal data. Uh, the next thing we do is extract from these logs uh, our, our, our samples, our feature vectors that we want to pass to our learning algorithm. Um, so because this is really a, it's, it, we, we want to recognize patterns uh, between the levels of the tanks over time. Uh, it's a time series data, we want to uh, use a feature vector of the form like this, so pi and pi prime. And our pi here is just, is just capturing the, the levels of the five tanks at one particular moment of time, and then your pi prime is uh, the level of those same five tanks after a certain amount of time has, has passed, so after a fixed time interval. So um, uh, this, this time interval is common for all of these, these vectors. So for the positive samples, this is quite straightforward. We just uh, go to our data log and we extract as many as possible. Uh, for the negative samples, uh, we do the same, um, but also run a check to make sure that it's distinguishable from the normal behavior. So this is one benefit of having a simulator and obviously a, a drawback were we to do it on the real system. Um, so at this point, uh, we then apply a supervised learning algorithm. So the, here we used um, SVM. Uh, the reason we wanted to do this was because of we're non-experts in this area, quite frankly, and we saw plenty of success in the past of using this to build models for time series data. And plus, we also, uh, our group comes from a verification background. We wanted to try and learn something as simple as possible so we could do some interesting verification tasks with it. Albeit, that bit didn't quite work out, but we did get a model which can take uh, a new pair of, of pi and pi prime and, and give you, with a reasonable amount of accuracy, a judgment as to whether it's representing some normal relation between the tank levels or some abnormal one. Uh, so the final thing we did was, of course, validate the model. Uh, we wanted to check that there was some statistical evidence uh, of, the, uh, of the model um, being a physical invariant of the system. So we applied some statistical tests. We applied SPRT uh, to sample uh, new feature vectors from distinct initial configurations and uh, until the stopping criteria were met and uh, this judgment was made. Uh, some more details are in the paper. Uh, we also looked at some uh, varying some uh, parameters, if you will, uh, such as what kind of classification function for SVM uh, and how large the fixed time interval should be. So I'm, I'm not going to go into these in this talk, but rather focus on these two questions here. How many mutants uh, do we need? And is the model useful? Does it have some utility? for detecting uh, code modification attacks or other kinds of attacks. So looking at the number of mutants, uh, we generated uh, cumulatively from 300 to 700. Of course, I should highlight here that there's actually a, a rather a poor ratio between the number that turned out to be effective at, at giving you some abnormal data, uh, as well as be between that and the raw mutants. So obviously this is something that, that can be approved by using things such as domain knowledge or some program synthesis techniques to direct the generation of, of, of mutants more, more effectively. Our technique at the moment is quite naive. 
Um, but once uh, we get to between 60 and 80 in our experiments, uh, effective mutants that is, we find that the data we have uh, starts getting a reasonable amount of accuracy in terms of the num, you know, in terms of classifying uh, your uh, your pi pi prime as normal or abnormal uh, correctly. Um, with respect to attacks, uh, we evaluated against uh, two different kinds. First of all, we looked at some some code modification attacks coming from this motivation uh, we had uh, to do physical attestation. Uh, so we detected, uh, we, we, we rather uh, randomly generated uh, 40 new effective mutants um, and used our model uh, to try and detect them. And uh, we detected all but seven in this case uh, with, with a high level of accuracy. Uh, so the seven that it didn't detect when we investigated it uh, by hand, we found that the, the, the mutants did have some effect, but a very, very minor one. So they weren't particularly effective and probably uh, they, they, didn't, they didn't have such a, uh, enough of a physical effect on the system to be detected. Um, a, a perhaps a more interesting one, uh, the previous one was a set of, of, of randomly generated attacks. Uh, this is a set of, this is a benchmark of attacks produced uh, by, by some, some researchers using this system, this SWOT system. Um, and we picked out the ones concerning the, the water flow processes, which we focused on. So in particular over here, uh, you can see that it affects a bunch of different attack points. We have NBs, which are your motorized valves, letting water into the tanks. We have Ps, which are the pumps for pumping the water out. And the LITs, which are your level indicator transmitters, essentially your sensors at the tank level. Um, and the attacks did a few different things, starting at the ones at the top, which are quite simple. You know, something is off, you turn it on. Something is on, you turn it off. Um, but we also had some different kinds of attacks where uh, we manipulated things more slowly. So um, starting by increasing the, 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 manipulating the value of the sensor by a very small amount uh, every second until eventually something is triggered in the system. So we were quite happy uh, to see that all of these were at least eventually detected. Uh, here you're, the accuracy means, uh, you know, from the moment that the attack started, how many of the feature vectors from the logs uh, were, were, were classified as abnormal. So it's in the 90s for the majority of them. Um, for the two attacks that I have designated eventually, the reason for this is because uh, the sensors are increasing, the, the sensors are being manipulated by a small amount over time, and it's not until those values get to a certain point that the system triggers um, uh, an actuator, such as opening the valve or switching on a pump. And actually, once it gets to those points um, of when the attack has a physical effect, uh, then the accuracy from that point on is, is also very high, so, so in the 90s. Okay, so um, we were encouraged by these results, um, but of course there are some, some uh, threats to validity, some limitations I, I do want to highlight. Um, so first of all, this has been focused on a single system, uh, SWOT. So you might argue that uh, you know, this, you know, having this time interval that you're checking your data between, this might not work so well in a system where an attack can have a more profound effect more immediately. In a system like SWOT, it takes a little while for the attack to have an effect. It takes a while to fill up the tanks and overflow it, and that sort of thing. And also the code modification attacks. Um, so these were, these were essentially generated randomly. We wanted to make sure that our, our model could pick these out, whatever they were. Uh, but a real attacker is likely to be uh, more intelligent than sort of randomly uh, changing constants here and there. So we want to do a more rigorous evaluation of, of that part of, of the work. Um, also, perhaps the data collection is, is, is too onerous to apply without a simulator at the moment, but this is something we're addressing with, with ongoing work, with more targeted mutations, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And um, we also have to assume that the data here, the, the data that's being logged, is, is not compromised. So using this on its own uh, is, is risky, of course, if somebody has control of the network. Um, but in the in, in, in the SWOT lab at, at SUTD, there are other uh, groups working on similar projects uh, to monitor the, the health of the network. So these things should be done in tandem. Um, so some take home points from this talk. Uh, we proposed an approach uh, for learning models of uh, cyber physical systems through the simulators semi-automatically. So we, we evaluated it principally on, on, on SWOT, but I don't see why it wouldn't generalize to systems with similar characteristics. Um, and at the core of this, we were using code mutations. 
uh, as our way of systematically generating abnormal data traces. Um, and the evaluation has some positive signs uh, that we might be able to use it for physical attestation and so on. Uh, but of course, there's a lot more to be done. Um, so in, in light of the, the time running out, I'm going to skip over the future work. Uh, of course, we can discuss it. But I, I, I want to highlight that the facilities uh, at our university, they're not just for us. They're, they're available for anyone to use. So if you're interested in using our, our test beds, we have one for the water treatment, of course. We also have um, uh, the EPIC uh, power grid on the bottom left uh, if you want to play with electricity. We've only had one fire so far. Uh, please let us know. Or please let me know. I can put you in touch or work together. So thank you very much. We have time for a few questions. Hi, uh, this is a very nice work. Uh, I am Alvaro Cardenas from UT Dallas, and uh, I was wondering in your feature detection, you, you have only the height of the tanks, so mm. basically only the sensor measurements as your feature vector. Yes. I was wondering why didn't you consider also the control signals as well, or is that? Um, yeah, so at the moment we just, we, we, we just uh, use the physical properties in our model, but this is, uh, we, we wanted to try and keep it as simple as possible and, and get a result with as little information as possible. Um, but this is something we do want to look into now. Uh, yeah, right, right, because I think uh, no model is complete of the physical system if you only look at the sensor. You also mm. have to take into account, like if I turn something on, you see something being on, and then you can expect that to be reflected in the sensor measurements. So related to that, uh, I think, I don't know uh, if you have seen this in, um, there's this theory called system identification. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if you've seen it before. This is a use also to learn these models by randomly exciting the system and then you create uh, the models. And uh, I actually, yeah, we, there's a paper in CCS two years ago that uses that for the same test, but that you're using. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> would be interesting to look. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah. Um, I don't know if you have seen those models, the system identification models. I, I, I would surely like to look at that in more detail. Okay, okay thanks. And uh, I think that's it. Yeah. Well, good work. Thank, Thank you. you. Hey, uh, Chen Zhen from Temple University. Uh, I guess this work um, mainly uh, fo focuses on extracting the environments. So I may have missed something, but I'm, I was wondering why, why don't you analyze the code directly to extract the environment? Uh, extract the invariance from the code. Yeah. Um, so it's, it, 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 it's quite difficult. We found it was quite difficult to do so without the, the bigger picture of the system. Because the uh, code is uh, unavailable to you, or? Uh, no, the, co the, the code is available. Uh, uh, but uh, the, the physical part and, the, and, uh, and this control part are so intrinsically linked uh, that it's difficult. It, it, it's, it's difficult to do it from the code alone. Um, Hi, Mary from uh, Department of Defense. Uh, I just had a quick question on if your simulations were virtual or if you actually had physical like simulation of the PLC. Uh, a virtual or, or physical. So the, the, the simulator itself, mm -hmm. it's, um, it's, it, it's essentially a, a, a translation of the original PLC code in, in AdLogic to, to Python. Um, and uh, it was and, and so it's essentially a Python program that we're running uh, with a, a bunch of cross-validation that was done against the real system to make sure that we tightened up the, the, the model processes of the, of, of, of the water flow. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean otherwise by the, the, the virtual law. If you actually used a PLC for the simulation or if you, but you, are, you answered that. Ah, Thank okay, you. yeah. <laughs> okay, so we have only uh, 30 seconds left, so one quick question from Rob. Sure. Uh, um, over here. Um, I, I have a question sort of as similar to what was asked before. You, you have a, sounds like a very uh, exquisitely accurate simulation. Mm. What is it that um, using a machine learning technique in the middle gets you that you don't have from just the simulator itself? Um, it's es essentially about uh, we want to be able to identify uh, attacks that we don't know about. So we want to sort of build up this picture, uh, extract all of these patterns, uh, 
uh, from the data that are not so, so clear to us as, as, as engineers of the system uh, or designers of the, of, of the ladder logic um, in the hope that if, if somebody invents an attack in the future that, that, that uh, goes against these patterns that it would be detected. Um, so it's really uh, some, some work that's gone on in the lab has been sort of uh, manually defining invariants based on sort of an expert's understanding of the system. Uh, but what we're hoping to do here is sort of make some steps uh, into moving to that point where we can defend against attacks we don't know about beyond those. Okay, so with this, let's thank uh, okay. Chris another thank you. again.